morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Legislative Task Force on Aging. Uh, today is February 9th. The first item on the agenda today, there is a quorum present, either in person or online. Um, we would like to begin today with the adoption of the previous minutes. Those minutes are from the uh, January 9th, 2024 meeting. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of passage, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes are adopted. We have an extremely full agenda today, and we want to leave time for some discussion of the members of the task force at the end. So what I would like to do is to begin with public testimony. I'm going to ask that you please, please keep your testimony to two to three minutes at the max. If you go on longer, I will say, please wrap up, and please don't take it as a personal attack. So we're just trying to make sure that everybody has time to have their voice heard in the discussion today. And with that, we will begin with Joan Stockinger with Elder Climate Action. And Joan will be followed by Jonathan Rose. When you're ready, if you'd please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. OK, thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Joan Stockinger, and I'm here representing Elder Climate Action Twin Cities. It's part of a national organization. We're a group of elders concerned about climate and the legacy we are leaving behind. We are nonpartisan. Our mission is to work for preserving a livable planet for our grandchildren, future generations, and all life. Thank you for your time. You know, we believe that your task force on aging would be wise to consider climate change in addressing the needs of elders, both current and future elders. What is the connection, you may ask, between Task Force on Aging and Climate Change. We have two main points we want to make. The first is that elders as a group are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change, including heat and air quality. Already in many places on Earth where heat has increased to a critical point, we see elders becoming ill and dying at a far higher rate than the general population. And we often see it as more difficult for elders to evacuate. We're seeing that in California in the natural catastrophes intensified by climate change, flooding, fires, storms, and so on. And elders often need more help to prepare, evacuate, and respond. Some attention to these things is needed in housing, transportation, and in planning for livable communities. The second big area, and I really want to stress this, it's a little more vague. Many elders care deeply about the environment, climate change, and the damage and depletion we are leaving for our children, grandchildren, and generations. Recent research on climate voters, for those of you who are elected, shows that um, the vo elder voters over 60 are the second most likely to list climate as their top issue when voting after very young voters. So elder voters vote for climate and environment. Climate experts believe a critical obstacle in addressing climate change is short-term thinking. Climate solutions require long-term community-wide actions. As elders, we have come to recognize we are all beneficiaries of a legacy, and we will leave a legacy behind. We want to be good ancestors, and we think beyond our lifetimes. So what does this have to do with the commission? The wisdom of elders speaking to long-term, speaking of the common good, and speaking of concern for those who come after, these are ideas that can create support for more effective long-term policies and programs. The task force and a Department of Aging can assist elders elevate their voices in small and large ways. Elder wisdom will help move the needle toward long-term thinking and effective action. I would just like to add, in our culture, we don't emphasize the voices of elders. And there might be some very simple things like holding a um, conference, an annual conference on elders. Many, there are a number of countries now that have departments of, of the future. We could have a commission of elders for the future that could weigh in and use their voice to talk about the long-term implications of what we're doing short term and say this is a good bill for the short term but in the long term we would want to do it differently. So thank you again for your time. We ask that you incorporate climate change and climate action into your work and any plans and structures that you create. Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it and we appreciate your voice at the table. Thank you. Next we will have Jonathan Rose and Mr. Rose will be followed by Myrna Kay. 
When you're ready, if you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Clevin and members of the task force. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Dr. Jonathan Rose, Executive Director for All Elders United for Justice. We're a nonprofit organization organized to fight ageism and its devastating consequences. Even though our organization is only a couple of years old, collectively, our members have over a thousand years of experience working and advocating for justice for seniors and their families. At other elders, we address multiple issues such as caregiving, housing, and transportation, recognizing that outcomes in one area affect the other. So today, I want to talk briefly about broadband equity. It is well established that affordable broadband has become a necessary utility for daily living, just as electricity and heat are necessary utilities. In May of 2023, the Surgeon General, in talking about what he called the epidemic of loneliness and isolation, said that one of the six foundational pillars to remedy loneliness and isolation was the reformation of digital environments. That means that, among other things, we need to provide equitable broadband access for everyone. We provide phones, smartphones, for indigent people and social assistance because smartphones are necessary tools for them to communicate with the state's service agencies. Similarly, we believe that broadband access should be available to everyone at affordable prices, and we believe that when necessary, indigent people should have reasonable broadband access as well. The future broadband infrastructure is being built and expanded using taxpayer funds. Therefore, we as taxpayers are shareholders, and as shareholders, we're entitled to the full benefits of ownership. These benefits include relief from unaffordable market prices and entitlement to equitable access and training for broadband technology. As we continue to expand and improve broadband services, it will be a travesty if we create full access while denying access for most seniors and people on low income because they cannot afford it or because they do not have basic training in using the services. Therefore, we are urging the legislature to, one, categorize broadband as a necessary utility, two, affirm the taxpayer's ownership in the broadband infrastructure, and three, regulate the services on behalf of shareholder taxpayers so that unaffordable costs are not imposed upon the elderly and low-income groups. Thank you very much for your time. For not calling you Dr. Rose in the beginning. That's I've, perfectly fine. I so appreciate the conversations that we've had uh, in the past, and I appreciate your testimony Hopefully here today. We'll have some more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Next, we will hear from Myrna K. Peterson, and followed by Diane Petty, uh, <laughs> and both of these will be virtual. Um, Ms. Peterson, if you would please um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Absolutely. Good morning. My name is Myrna Peterson. I'm extremely happy to be here. I am a 74-year young retired educator and quadriplegic because of an auto accident when I was 40, 45 years old on June 21st, 1995. I moved to Grand Rapids, Minnesota 10 years after my accident in 2005. I'd been medicated with very strong narcotics because of a misdiagnosis, causing severe pain. My condition was not healthy, and I was encouraged to go to a treatment center to flush out all the narcotics out of my system. After three weeks of rehab with able-bodied teenagers and young people in their 20s, I was determined to use my limited mobility to advocate for the rights of differently abled people. My cliche is that I only have one thumb that works, but I have a mouth that won't quit. 
anyway, I endured 25 surgeries within the first 20 years of my accident, but then was part of setting a Guinness Book of World Records on May 20, 15, 2015. We had 351 wheelchairs rolling in succession for three minutes. Overwhelmed at seeing that many people in wheelchairs at that event, we decided to host meetings in four different cities within Itasca County to learn why. We learned that the top four barriers preventing differently abled people from um, participating in events outside of their homes were first, lack of accessible transportation. Two, poor entrances getting into and within buildings. Three, poor sidewalks, cutaways and curbs, trails included, and the lack of public awareness of accessibility needs. I helped to establish 501c3 called Mobility Mania, Accessibility for All, to make some positive changes. Our mission is to increase accessibility awareness, to make Itasca County the showcase of accessibility in Minnesota, and to raise finances for local accessibility needs. Mobility Mania is fortunate to have the support of our Grand Rapids community. Um, we've gone on to do so many valuable things, getting accessible vans for uh, people in need, doing an accessible playground. We did some uh, work with um, MnDOT to increase better sidewalks along the highway. Um, I'm currently serving my second four-year term on the Minnesota Governor's Advisory Council on Connected and Automated Vehicles, exploring driverless vehicles and buses. Grand Rapids is a pilot site for this new technology. Three of our five self-driving vans are ADA compliant and are part of Go Marty, Minnesota's Autonomous Rural Transit Initiative, an 18-month pilot project. We recently received an attained federal grant for 9.2 million to expand the GoMarty project using electric um, vehicles that are AD compliant. I'm also currently serving my second three-year term on Minnesota Council on Disability. I represent people with DEEDS Region 3 by providing resources available at the state level and share their concerns as they fit into our legislative efforts. It's a great way to stay connected with other people. Locally, I'm on the Rife Performing Arts Council as chair, serve on McCrasty Arts Center, Grand Rapids Arts and Culture Commission. I have a passion for getting differently able people involved in visual and performing arts in our community. Art is an expression that can be a creative way, building confidence and self-worth. It's a great way to bring uh, appreciation for these unique artists. Um, we are all better together and the diversity of abilities and age increases the quality of life and acceptance of others in our community. My personal mission is that yesterday is gone. None of us are promised tomorrow. We all need to make the most of today. Thank you for supporting those needs of both the elderly and people with different abilities. Given us some great reminders today, and you are an inspiration to many. So thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next, welcome. thank you. Next, we will move on to Diane Pettit, who is also virtual, and then um, she will be followed by Rick Heller. Um, Ms. Pettit, when you're ready, if you would please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Betty, you're muted right now. Ms. Petty, you're muted right now. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I thought I had pressed that on you. My name is Diane Piet. I am so humbled to be in the presence of this legislative body and the brilliant people that spoke before me. I am a country 
caregiver. My household includes my husband, who is um, 73 with Alzheimer's, and my mother is 94. She's had a full leg prosthesis for 69 years, having cancer when we were toddlers, and so her mobility and energy are down, but her cognitive abilities are amazing. So we are not in assisted living. We live on our farmstead and um, are able to help each other. I am primarily here, first and foremost, to tell you about a life-giving service that's provided to me. I call it life-giving um, by the volunteer services of Carleton County in Minnesota. I live in Pine County, just across the county line, but have been welcomed to this group. And it's an amazing program that I think can be replicated so much and it'd be a, a noble way to spend some of our tax dollars. The whole team um, provides attentive, fun programming to stimulate every aspect of aging brains and bodies. It's faithfully joyful volunteers, it's um, advocates, the staff is remarkable. And then I wanna honor those people that have to do all of that um, communicating and grant writing and tireless work behind the scenes, the part that needs really intense support. Um, the social aspect and sense of purpose that it brought back, it restored to us, to bring my husband out of a deep depression with anxiety during that phase one of his cognitive disability. We've had an Alzheimer's diagnosis for six years, and there was a decline when he knew how much and how fast it was slipping. His um, background is in head injury trauma rehab, speech and language pathology, understands the brain greatly. We anticipated a little since his father and uncles all had Alzheimer's, but you still aren't ready gracefully um, to move into that. So I bring my husband to the daybreak program of respite every Monday, um, and that's from 10.30 to 2.30, and well, as I say, the joy and the laughter and the sense of purpose is amazing for him. And then we attend the fabulous Memory Cafe on Wednesdays. And sometimes I can bring my mom along to that as well. And uh, just imagine if you are the caregiver in your household 24-7 um, and sometimes very intense, sometimes emergency rooms, um, that here you're welcome to a catered wonderful meal um, and sweet programming. And um, some of the folks there have cognitive disabilities and some physical, but all are um, it, just welcomed. And we make that effort, especially on journaling days, to get there. So becoming introduced and welcome to a program like that offered has been invaluable to us because then it opens up all the other things that are available for you, too. And I hope that for people in places that can't get there, and if I were unable to drive, if my car didn't work, um, that um, somebody would be able to do that. So there's a funding source for transportation for rural people. And like a lot of farm, just farm community folks, we weren't really searching out or asking for the services. So there needs to be a way to get to it, the promotion of it so that they know that this social aspect is available and that it could be. And that drivers could be available for, with no stigma for all kinds of things, not just for doctor's appointments and PT appointments, but to get them to a library to get them to the Carrick Fireman's Dinner and to get them to uh, a play cribbage and social things. So for simple quality of life and allowing people to stay and live in their homes and manage together and support each other, an outside program like what I have found to be offered to me is exceptional and just a noble use of tax dollars. And I, like the speaker before me, have been an educator and I solidly appreciate everything that's done for early childhood and K-12 education and appreciate that aging brains um, need this, this support too and that it is both economically sensible as everyone else points out, you know, for medical reasons and for um, that social aspect of mental health. And I thank you very much for allowing me to witness this meeting and to be a part of it today. Thank you very much for your participation. You give us a couple of really good things to remember, that if we're fortunate, we will all age in both body and brain. So I think that's really important for us to take home as a message today, as well as the importance of joy, laughter, and sense of purpose. Um, Mr. Heller, if you'll please come forward. We're asking um, testifiers to please keep their testimony to two to three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Heller. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony.
Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Rick Keller. I want to officially represent the people that have potential abilities, the twice exceptional and eligible persons. First of all, I find it discriminatory that you limit me at when I spoke, but didn't warn others about the time limits for this meeting, which is discriminatory or bias. Mr. Heller. That's, that's up to the chair. Uh, I just, I would like to clarify, uh, before you came in the room today, I said the exact same thing to everyone else. It was just before you arrived today. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I also suggest that, that uh, you create a, a protocol and uh, policy on the rules of this committee uh, as at discretion of the chair for public to know ahead of time as well. Uh, also, the accessibility policy. The document's currently online. I can point them out if time allows. They're not fully accessible. Minnesota, in 2019, legislature passed a bill during special session and a working group report came out last year about the legislature being fully digitally accessible with screen readers in Braille, or called Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Minnesota Statute 16E.03 Subdivision 9, which currently most state agencies follow. I also sent a document yesterday now. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever get online, but uh, based on in your protocol, you might also have a notice online about when documents will be posted. I still asked the document I sent to uh, Andrew George, Task Force Administrator, be posted. If time, discretion of the chair, once again, I'm going to briefly go over what the governor did last session by striking the word handicap and replacing it with print disability. And, and uh, the, what I provided in the document, hopefully we'll post it online for people to understand this, uh, is a, a quote from Library of Congress blog about taking blind and persons with disabilities and merging that with eligible persons. Currently, that's the federal terminology, not print disability. What's interesting about this is the technical piece, which was reported in the summaries for the Pacific language that was passed both in the House and Senate, uh, said it was only technical change. However, if you go into the application process, the certifying authority has changed dramatically. And hopefully you will review that, include that in your report, because I believe this, this, uh, this public testimony is about state policies. And if we're going to start putting in lingual words in the statute, perhaps the governor can do an executive order for state agencies, because one of the certifying authorities, since I came here to speak, is a registered nurse, a nurse that can do that, a therapist, a professional staff at a hospital institutions, public welfare agencies. And we're not even going to go into the school area. So I think this is all relevant to the big picture from kindergarten to death. And when the smartphones were mandated in 2018 to read out loud by the Federal Communication Commission, that's all relevant to people as they even get older and lose their sensory abilities that they can still communicate perhaps with their phones. But those that make stuff accessible, including those that offer documents as committee, manually check their documents before they submit them. Ms. Weber, prior Ms. Weber, you're all the LCC director to speak at the Lassard committee about this and also during government operations in the Senate about third parties bringing documents up to the legislature that are not compliant. Yet we have so many third parties here asking for some funding, yet Where's their responsibility doing what the legislature is going to be required to do in October 2024? Once again, I uh, appreciate uh, this communication and respect to the called twice eligible people that I, I, I can unofficially represent because we all know people first is relevant in the process of labeling. However, it's really about people getting effective access to information to stay connected with all their all all people. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak. I'm open to any questions. Obviously, this is not a question place, but 
Uh, I would suggest uh, the one last thing is that seeking support on, on House File 3299, helping to find a current jargon or lingo word in statute called twice exceptional. Thank you. Appreciate your being here, and I appreciate all the work you do through the state gov and local government committee as well. Thank and you. And I, I agree. Uh, appreciation is also what we choose to plug in, and thank you for that opportunity as well. That concludes our public testimony section for anyone who has signed up in advance. And we will move on to our item four on our agenda, the overview of the Minnesota long-term care demographics. Uh, Dr. Susan Brower. You'll state your name and begin your testimony. Hello, Chair Claiborne and members of the task force. My name is Susan Brower. I'm the state demographer for Minnesota, and I work in the Department of Administration. <clears throat> Do I have slides? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I spoke with you a few months ago, and there are more older adults in the state now than there were a few months ago. <laughs> there will be more <laughs> if I speak to you again in the, in the coming months. Um, in fact, in 2023, we reached a major milestone of 1 million older adults in the state of Minnesota, those over the age of 65. Um, there, we're within a period of tremendous growth, as you can see from this graphic, uh, between 2010 and 2030. Um, and with the increase in the older adult population will come an increase in need for long-term services and support and long-term care, especially as the baby boomers move into the older, older years, um, over the age of 65, over the age of 75, where we see some of those care needs increasing. So to kind of get a handle on what the population may be that's in need of those care services, uh, both long-term services and support, the broad range of services and long-term care, we typically look to rates of disability. Uh, and we can look a little bit further to see uh, what the living situation is of people who are uh, in the community because that helps us give a sense for what their resources might be uh, for their care. Uh, and so if we look at all people who have disabilities in Minnesota who are over the age of 65, that number is about 307,000. Um, that estimate comes from the American Community Survey's uh, uh, set of questions uh, that asks about disabilities, uh, specifically whether the respondent has difficulties with vision, hearing, mobility, cognitive functioning, as well as whether there are difficulties with independent living outside the home or self-care within the home. And so this is really our best uh, handle that we have on disabilities uh, within the community rather than from some kind of administrative record. Um, about uh, 276,000 Minnesotans who are over the age of 65 have a disability and live in the community in their households, and about 100,000 of those live alone with no one else in the household. And so these folks are the most uh, potentially at risk of, of needing some uh, paid support if they don't have that support outside of their household. Uh, additionally, from the American Community Survey, we can see, um, you know, who might have issues with independent living. Um, specifically, the question asks whether um, uh, there's difficulty going outside the home to shop or for a doctor's visit, and about 132,000 Minnesotans over the age of 65 uh, responded that they did. Uh, about 30,000 of those are in a nursing home setting already. Uh, and about 42,000 of those have difficulty going outside the home and they are living alone um, without someone else in the household. And finally, we can see for those who have uh, difficulties with self-care within the home, um, these are difficulties dressing, bathing, or getting around inside the home. 
the survey found that about 80,000 older adults, as of the most recent survey, uh, have this difficulty. Uh, about 20,000 of those live alone in, um, in the community, in a household. About 25,000 live uh, in nursing home care already. So that generally gives us a sense of what need may be in the community. Of course, it's not all those folks will need um, long-term care services or support, or certainly uh, not all of them will need um, to, to be in a facility for a short or a long term, but that generally gives us kind of the broad scope of who um, has disabilities in the state of Minnesota. So we need to look to um, some other kind of models and surveys nationally to look at more specifically who, what the need for long-term care may be. So we look at the national numbers uh, to get kind of what our sense is here. Um, one such recent report said that 70% of older adults will have some care needs before they die, about 50% requiring paid care. So a lot of that care is done informally. Most uh, periods of need are relatively short. Only about a quarter of older adults will need more than two years of paid care, uh, and that's the broader care of long-term services support, whether it's in a facility or not. About 15% will spend some time in a nursing home, and that is just what the experience is of 65-year-olds over the rest of their life. That's a 15% number, but if we look at any one point in time in Minnesota, the percent of older adults that are in a nursing home is about 3%. <clears throat> As for paying for, for long-term care, I guess I just want to start out by saying that this is not meant to be um, overly dramatic. It really is just the situation as we, can <laughs> as we read it from the numbers. Um, and it is a serious situation. <clears throat> Um, you know, when, when uh, national surveys are given, uh, they find that about 40% of Americans aren't confident that they'll be able to pay for the care that they need. Um, of the people who are just set to retire, about 28% say they have money set aside for their future care, about 50% for those 65 plus. And there's been a survey here in Minnesota that found a similar number. Uh, the survey of older Minnesotans uh, found that about 50% of uh, older adult Minnesotans would need to rely on a government program or they didn't know how they would pay for their own long-term care. 90% um, or more when surveyed uh, say it would be impossible to pay for the roughly $100,000 per year needed for nursing home care. And another study kind of confirms this number at the national number, they, they are at the national level, they come up with about 86 to 95% of those over the age of 65 unable to care for nursing home care, depending on the severity of the need. So nursing home care really for the majority of people turns out to be a publicly funded, largely publicly funded um, service. A final note about uh, populations of color as they age. Uh, we have research, we have reports that show higher rates of disability early in life within some cultural groups, US born African Americans and Hmong residents in Minnesota in particular. Some BIPOC groups have lower incomes, which make the inability to pay for long-term care, long-term services and supports a more widespread issue. And research has documented that BIPOC residents in long-term care facilities report lower quality of life along a number of measures. And I believe you have a, a report to that um, point. Um, so while BIPOC populations are relatively small in this age group, it's about 9% of all older adults, uh, the need for, for BIPOC older adults care appears to be greater, the cost less affordable, and the care less satisfactory. And so with that, uh, that is kind of my brief overview for you of, of the demographics for long-term care. Thank you, Dr. Brower. I always appreciate your coming before us and in this committee and in all the other committees that I've seen you testify in. It, you always teach me something new every time. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you for your testimony and thank you for the important work you do for our state. Thanks for having me.
long-term care. If you would please state your name and title for the record and then begin your testimony, I would appreciate it. Good morning, Genevieve Gaborio, Deputy Ombudsman for Long-Term Care, here on behalf of Cheryl Hennon. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today. We are an independent agency administratively housed within DHS, and DHS Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Natasha Mers came and spoke in front of this group a few months ago and touched on our program, but I'm delighted to share more about what we see in long-term care in nursing homes and assisted living. The Office of Ombudsman for Long-Term Care are advocates for residents receiving licensed long-term care services. We have a team of 30 staff who meet with residents every week, if not every day, all around the state. Our work can be something as simple as helping advise how to file a grievance or who to talk to about dietary changes uh, to something more complicated like defending an involuntary discharge from a nursing home or helping someone return when they're sent to a hospital for an acute illness and the facility does not want to take them back. We have a broad perspective on long-term care services and a database that reflects that broad perspective. In the federal fiscal year that just ended, we entered almost 50,000 activities into our database. Our mission, as you can see on the slide, is to empower, educate, and advocate alongside Minnesotans who are receiving long-term care services and supports to ensure their rights are withheld. And speaking about our work today is part of that advocacy work. We know there's a strong interest for many to remain in their homes in the community, but tens of thousands of Minnesotans choose to live in assisted living and nursing homes as where they want to live, to get their care, to have meals, have visits, participate in activities, and make their homes. And these settings are an important part of the aging continuum. Uh, everything we do, and I won't, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but everything we do in the Office of Ombudsman is person-centered. A call comes to the office, we establish what the client wants us to do, and then get to work. Many clients are not ready to speak up yet for a variety of reasons, so part of our work is building trust. And we educate about complaint channels within the facility, just talking to staff right on site, as well as outside agencies, uh, if appropriate. And then we encourage residents to speak up at resident councils or family councils so they can work together on a common concern about cold food or untended to housekeeping or, or new staff who aren't following care plans or whatever the, the wide variety of issues may be. As everyone in government knows, there's power in numbers and when people work together, it works better. So this slide shows where referrals come to from our office. Uh, last week, we submitted our federal National Ombudsman Reporting System report. Our reporting year follows the federal fiscal year um, and just ended in September 30th, 2023. You can see, I don't have numbers on this slide, but you can see the largest percentage uh, of the pie chart is 37% is of the complaints come from residents directly. Uh, we have information in facilities so they know how to find us. We're out and around um, so, so people can come to us directly. 31% are from resident representatives, that's family, friends, um, anyone else who um, works on behalf of the resident. And 15% uh, come from facility staff. We're really proud of that. That's actually an increase from about 25% over last year. We think that our, our larger office and more time out in communities has helped to build trust and relationships. So staff um, don't see us as a regulator, but see us as a support to come to, um, to help kind of troubleshoot and problem solve whatever the issue may be. We do always talk to the resident and find out what the resident wants us to do, but it's nice that that relationship um, is, is growing. So this is the slide I'll spend the most time on. It's a snapshot from our perspective of, of what we're seeing in, in long-term care right now. Uh, we're focusing on nursing facility and residential care facility. That's what we have to call it in our federal report, but it's really assisted living. Licensed assisted living is what we're using. Uh, and the other, the tiny sliver of other on this slide um, refers to hospice, home care, adult foster care, or some of the other areas where we do work. We, we also have scope to work with people receiving long-term care in their home, but the majority of our work is in these long-term care settings. So these are the three of, 
highest complaint categories from our report, um, admission, transfer, discharge, or eviction, um, has grown. Um, it stayed steady in nursing home over the past years, but it's grown in, with the assisted living licensure law because before that law went into place, there were two separate contracts and the home care provider or housing care provider could just give notice and, and there really wasn't a recourse. Now there's appeal rights, so that has generated a lot more work um, for our office, but we found that being able to be part of um, part of problem solving earlier on has, has resolved a lot of issues and very few have ended up going to hearing. Um, and residents have agreed, yes, I should move or we've solved whatever the underlying problem was and they've remained in their homes. Um, one real short snippet, I'll share a few short snippets to help illustrate these things, was a, a client called us because they said their management hasn't been helpful in getting the documents they need to qualify for medical assistance. Um, and they instead just issued a discharge for, for lack of payment and we were able to help get that payment process through and, and keep them stable. The middle section is of the slide deck is autonomy, choice, or rights. And that includes things like choice in healthcare, dignity, respect, privacy, retaliations. Um, the, the right to have an electronic monitoring camera falls under this category. And we've had cases where a family with resident consent has placed a camera that showed staff inappropriately moving a resident on camera, kind of shoving them from the chair to the bed and, and not pr appropriately lifting them um, from the bed back to the chair. Uh, you know, a, a picture really is worth a thousand words and footage like that that we're seeing has helped tell the story of what's going wrong with staff training and care. And it can be especially helpful with residents who due to their disease or other diagnoses are not able to articulate the care problems or abuse that they're facing. So I think the electronic monitoring law has been a success to help with our casework and, and help um, with abuse. Uh, I have uh, another example of um, a case regarding dignity and respect. In this example, the resident moved from an assisted living facility to a nursing home where they faced challenges receiving care and developing relationships with new caregivers. Um, the resident needed help from two people each morning to move and staff would come to their room, one staff would come to the room, shut off the light and then leave to get another worker. And the resident would wait and become nervous that their needs were forgotten and then have a long wait time for that second staff to come. Um, when approaching the resident, then she felt the staff were task oriented rather than compassionate. The resident wanted to be approached differently. Um, the resident talked with the staff about their concerns, but there hadn't been a resolution. Our regional ombudsman became involved, listened to the resident and family concerns and met with staff. Staff began supporting the residents, exercises that were ordered, worked on approaching the resident differently, and leadership provided guidance about the ways that staff were communicating with the resident. Ultimately, improvements were achieved and resident and family expressed satisfaction with the way they're treated with, with dignity going forward. The largest um, casework that we have is about care concerns and uh, there was they're kind of neck and neck across nursing homes and assisted livings with an increase about 14% of complaints in assisted living over last year. Care is anything you can imagine like accidents and falls, slow response to requests for assistance, care planning issues, personal hygiene, incontinence care and more. Uh, one brief example was a case where a regional ombudsman met with a resident about something else and went to the resident's room at two o'clock in the afternoon to follow up on that other matter. She found the resident lying in his bed in pain. Uh, he had not received his ADM medication, which included pain pills from a recent fall while he was in the facility. The regional ombudsman asked the client if, if he wanted her to immediately work on, you know, sometimes it takes a long time, sometimes we can just, let's, let's solve it right here. And he said, yes, please find a nurse that could pass me meds so I can I can get them. Um, the regional ombudsman found a nurse in the hallway um, who came right away, appeared to leave the med cart unlocked when she came to work with that resident, which is another concern, and did bring him his medicine. Um, so that piece was resolved, but then she did not have the answer to his questions about what happens with his eight o'clock medication. Does that need to be delayed? 
since these meds were given so late. Um, so care can, can be a concern. Um, we have another case example about a resident who lived in a rural assisted living facility, was experiencing emotional and verbal abuse by a staff member who was curt, disrespectful, and degrading. The resident had been upset about this treatment and confided in her family members. The family members reported these concerns to the assisted living director, but no resolution had occurred. The regional ombudsman was conducting a routine access visit. That's when our staff just go out to facilities and talk with folks and see how things are going. Um, the RO met with the resident who shared her concerns and gave consent for the RO to help, despite being worried about retaliation. The regional ombudsman met with the administrator and assisted living director to discuss the abuse immediately. And this was a happy result. Within one day, the administrator confirmed a report had been made to the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center and the staff member was terminated. In the following weeks, the resident and her family reported great relief that the resident was no longer experiencing abuse, felt safe to use her call light to ask for help, and both the resident and family now understand available resources to help solve problems in the future. So I have some more examples. I know we're running a little late on time, so I'll, I'll skip ahead to that. I, I'll say that these care complaints are a troubling snapshot of what we see. Of course, there are providers giving good care every day, but we're seeing too many complaints now. Um, the state demographer touched on this, that, that Dr. Tatiana Shippey of the U of M has done some fascinating research on disparities between BIPOC residents and white residents in nursing homes. Um, she found that quality of life is impacted by the environment of the nursing home and that nursing homes with more BIPOC residents were typically larger and for-profit, um, which suggests that perhaps minimum staffing ratios or, or other, other things may be looked at to help improve care. Uh, we do support more financial transparency to understand all the money that the state is spending and that private payers are spending to care to understand where it is going and, and how many of those dollars go direct to care. Yeah. Here's our contact information. Send anyone to our intake line if they have concerns and we'll get you to the right regional ombudsman. And we also have a lot of information and resources on our website. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy Ombudsman. I greatly appreciate your testimony today. I believe that for the sake of time today, I do have questions, but I think I will provide them to your office in written form. <laughs> and I will ask that uh, once those, once you have time to um, put answers together, that you would submit them with the understanding that we will post them publicly. So those, um, and those questions will come to you shortly. That works well, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And next, we will move on to our presentation on the greenhouse model of nursing homes. Oh, and this will be done uh, virtually. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Zimmerman from the University of North Carolina will speak with us about that. And then um, what I'm going to do is ask that we keep these um, as concise as possible. We can read the slides um, that are presented as well. So um, with that, I would ask that Dr. Cheryl Zimmerman identify herself for the record and then um, begin your testimony. Yep, you're muted there. I believe, I, I believe the muting is there we go. now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cheryl Zimmerman. I'm from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I thank you for the opportunity to present to you about the greenhouse model of nursing home care. The greenhouse model grew out of the culture change movement in nursing homes, which began over 25 years ago. And it was focused on improving resident quality of life and quality of care by omitting, by limiting the, the feeling of deinstitutionalization of nursing homes and focusing more on person-centered care. We know people don't want to live in nursing homes, and we just heard about some of the challenges of living in nursing homes. So how do we go about doing this? And I'm sorry, I've got to get my slides to work. There we go. We go about doing this by focusing on resident direction, more of a home environment, 
close relationships, empowering the staff to work one on one with residents, collaborating with residents in decision making and systematic quality improvement. The key example of culture change in nursing homes has been the Greenhouse Project. Their tagline is meaningful transformation that creates lives worth living. Why are they called greenhouse homes? It builds on the green, uh, the Eden alternative, which was a first model of culture change. Greenhouses nurture plants, green houses nurture people. Obviously difference between plants and people with the same common focus. What it is, it's a radical shift in how we think about what nursing homes are about, how they provide care, why they provide care, but doing it within current regulatory structures. And how that's done is by focusing on three particular areas, architecture, philosophy, and the organizational structure. There's three different core values that embrace those transformations. The first has to do with a real home. Greenhouse homes have no more than 10 to 12 beds. They're, they're, they are meant to feel and look like a home. They're built so that they're similar to the surrounding community and they don't look like a nursing home any different than what's in the rest of the community. Private bedrooms and bathrooms look very much like one might want and have in a private home. Kitchens. This is a very much more focused on a residential kitchen. The kitchen is open to the older adults who live there, except at the most busy times when the food is being cooked in the kitchen. The elders can actually prepare food with supervision. And of course, there's built in safety features to assure that no one's going to be injured while doing so. Another component of greenhouse homes is a dining room. People eat together. You see a hearth in the background, very home like features. There's the hearth again, central living room, um, so that people feel as if they're living in a house, not in an institutional nursing home. And easy access to the outdoors. Second key value is meaningful life, very much person-centered, placing decisions with the older adult so that they can direct their care. In terms of how this happens, there's a focus on relationships. So there's a deep, close relationship between the people who work there and the people who live there. And the focus is on supporting a life worth living, thinking about engagement, enjoyment, and purpose. And the third value is empowered staff, so that staff really are focusing on the person, not quote unquote, the work that they're supposed to be doing. The older adult in greenhouse homes called the elder, that person is in the center of the chart, why people are there and why the care is being provided a very radical change in how leadership is looked at and what different roles and responsibilities are. So this is what you would see is a traditional um, uh, flow chart in terms of how organization is done in a traditional nursing home with administration being at the very top, working down to the CNAs, the nursing assistants at the bottom, um, very hierarchical. The greenhouse home looks very different. That you see the elder is right in the middle and those S's around the side, those are what in other places are called nursing assistants, but we're changing. The greenhouse model has changed the words to change the paradigm, how we think about it. They're referred to as Shabazz or Shabazim, which is another word for Royal Falcon. They circle around the older adult. There's not an administrator, there's a guide. And then the importance of volunteers to be active so that there's a real um, relationship to the outside community. Greenhouse homes first began in 2003. As of literally today, 401 homes, you can see how many across 35 states. Also, there's now more of an international movement. So what do we know about greenhouse homes? They feel like a really good model of care, but are they a good model of care? I've got two slides with two and false questions. Um, so you could just think for yourself, what would you think? Is, is it good to have private rooms and bathrooms? Is it good to have non-institutional dining? And is it good to allow people to engage in daily activities? The data show that yes, it is true. That private rooms and bathrooms are very good to limit infection prevention, if nothing else. Non-institutional dining, there's good data that say that people eat more. And it is not true, however, normalized engagement. People do need support to be able to be engaged. They're not just going to get engaged because they can go cook. They need to be supported to do it. One more set of true false questions. Is the quality of life better? Is there more social engagement? And is depression less? 
Yes, quality of life is considered to be better. Yes, um, they are more socially engaged, but there is not less depression. It takes more than just a, a better model of cure to decrease depression. So the question that has come up over time is that with good psychosocial outcomes, but with the medical staff being more on the periphery, what has this done to the, the medical and health related quality of care? And, and, if, and if that has been challenged, what about costs? There's been studies done in that area as well. I will summarize um, two, two sets of studies. One is the impact of greenhouse homes on nursing home quality and related expenditures. This was a study, I won't bother you with the details. This is a study that looked at outcomes of 72 greenhouse nursing homes compared to 233 traditional nursing homes. And at the very bottom there, what you see is this study looked at quality and spending. The quality that was examined was, was there a difference in hospitalizations? Was there a difference in people who had to go back to the hospital after they were had been hospitalized? And then many of these different traditional quality measures, bedfast, incontinence, et cetera. And on the right-hand side, different types of utilization and spending related to, did people in greenhouse homes need more health care? Again, because the medical staff were more on the periphery. What we found was actually, um, and to some people, surprisingly, there was actually fewer hospital readmissions. So when people came back from a hospital, they were less likely to be readmitted. Fewer bed fast residents, fewer catheter use, and fewer low risk pressure ulcers. So these medical indicators actually benefited from what had historically been seen as more of a psychosocial model of care. Also, and relatedly, Medicare spending decreased. As you see the amount here, less Medicare spending in greenhouse homes than in traditional nursing homes. How might this have happened? Well, hospitalization is the biggest spending item. And so with fewer readmissions, that's probably where costs were saved. And what we know in other projects is that there's better care management, there is less hospitalization. And that might be at the third bullet here, where greenhouse homes really benefit. Residents are in closer contact with those Shabazz, Shabazim, and the more person-centered person model of care is felt to lead to those fewer readmissions, less Medicaid, Medicare spending, and fewer bed fast catheters and pressure ulcers because the staff know the residents better and see things that are changing as they're changing. One more study about an outcome, very important, very timely, is we compared um, greenhouse nursing homes to smaller traditional nursing homes and larger traditional nursing homes in terms of COVID and deaths from COVID. And in this slide, we compared, you see those colors in the bars, the purple is the greenhouse homes, the yellow is traditional smaller nursing homes, the green is larger nursing homes. We compared whether there were a different number of COVID cases, and we saw there were significantly fewer COVID cases in greenhouse homes, even compared to smaller nursing homes. So it's not just size. And also there was less mortality for people when they did um, get COVID, significantly less mortality. How might this have happened? Private bedrooms and bathrooms, fewer staff and fewer admissions could have limited the cases. Psychosocial well-being could have benefited because this, there's this universal staffing, more person-centered staffing, more staff per resident day, and perhaps more visits from residents could have increased psychosocial quality of life, which we know is important to, for mortality. Uh, but I will point out with the third bullet here is that there are different, there still are differences between greenhouse homes that could have re resulted in some of these differences. They tend to be not-for-profit, staff tend to get paid more, so they're less likely to have more than one job and the residents um, do have fewer um, risk outcomes. Thank you very much for letting me present this very important and innovative model of care. If there's questions, I'd be happy to follow up with the committee. My contact information is there. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Zimmerman, I appreciated hearing this presentation. And as we go forward with our report, um, the committee may have questions and we'll reach out to you at a further time, if that's, if that's all right with you. A future time. Yeah. Next, we will move on to uh, Melissa Schneider. 
the Chief Operating, Operating Officer for Episcopal Homes. If you're ready, um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yeah, hi, welcome. I'm Melissa Schneider, Chief Operating Officer at Episcopal Homes of Minnesota. So um, following up to Dr. Zimmerman's presentation, we have six greenhouse homes um, right down on University in Fairview, so very close to us here at the Capitol. So um, sharing with you a little bit about our experience with greenhouse homes and the outcomes that we've seen through our greenhouse homes. So um, similar to Dr. Zimmerman's testimony, we have seen um, very significant outcomes with our greenhouse homes compared to traditional nursing homes. Um, some of the areas that we're succeeding are um, occupancy. So since we opened our homes in 2015, we have been over 90% occupied since the inception of our greenhouse homes and really any beds that we have open are generally just related to turnover. We have about 100 person waiting list to get into our homes. Um, our quality of life scores, as we've heard both from the Ombudsman's office and from the last testimony, quality of life and dignity I think is really important as we look at our seniors in our nursing homes. Our dignity scores I'm very proud of. We score at 98% positivity for dignity in our homes. And you know, as I talk about recommendations at the end of this, I think it's really important to think about that dignity and dignity versus risk in our nursing homes as we work with our regulators in the dignity area. Um, our clinical quality measures are spot on with the testimony we just heard. Our rehospitalization rate is 60% lower than the national average. Uh, we beat the clinical quality measures in almost every area of the national average. Um, our staffing ratios are, we um, pull in at an hour and 20 minutes more a day of nursing care per resident per day. And our direct care staff retention rate is 73.4% compared to the national average of 52.7. So we have really seen significant positive outcomes with this model of care. And uh, I really do believe it is the empowered staff and the meaningful life focus that we have at the greenhouse home that contributes to keeping our staff, having our staff engaged, and really having them feel like they are the key in that relationship with the resident. It is not top-down leadership. It is where the care is happening, that the care matters. Um, throughout the pandemic, we have actually never used agency staff in our greenhouse homes, which is, um, not something many nursing homes can say. So since the inception, we've never used agency staff. All of our staff are our own. So I think that's something that also speaks to the quality of the job and that staff enjoy working in this type of environment. So I think, you know, looking at recommendations for how other nursing homes could look to amplify this in Minnesota, um, Finding ways to incentivize culture change is very important. Uh, the, the organization has to support culture change from the entire organization. So I think any rule or regulation based mandates for culture change would not be successful. It has to be incentive based where providers can see why it matters, why it's important to lead culture change as an organization and what the impact can be to their outcomes, to their residents and to their financial bottom line. Um, for us, the private room incentive uh, that we get through DHS to have private rooms is what makes this model financially sustainable for us. So I think that's an important thing to be aware of is that those financial incentives matter in being able to provide this level of care and the staffing ratios that we do provide. Um, also related to the greenhouse, I do think it's important to know that to be considered a greenhouse home, you have to be built as a greenhouse home. So that would be a challenge for some of our nursing homes who have been here, who have been around, who were built as institutional nursing homes with long hallways and long units. Um, we have two nursing homes in our organization. One is a greenhouse nursing home and one is an older nursing home that was built in 1968. So that nursing home is not a greenhouse home, but we did renovate it in 2008 to become a household model of care. And so I think that's another opportunity when you look at how to incentivize culture change and home-like in nursing homes is, can it be more home-like? So we have in that building six units that are 15 to 21 residents. And so again, they have their own kitchen, they have their own dining room, they have consistent caregivers, um, but it's considered home-like or that household model of care. Um, even with us having some of the highest staffing rates in the state of Minnesota, we would not meet the federal staffing mandate that's coming. 
because of the RN staffing mandate. So with this model, you see that the caregiver ratio is very high. Uh, our Shabazz that are at the table, they are elevated. They are doing more. And the federal staffing mandate has expectations for RN hours that we do not currently meet. And part of that is also that they are not um, talking about the LPN workforce. So LPNs are extremely important to our model of care in nursing homes. And I think to discredit them and act like they don't exist in a staffing mandate is really unfortunate. So I think that's an important thing to be aware of as um, that goes forward. And then uh, my last piece would be, you know, dignity versus risk with regulations. So as we give our residents more dignity, as we give them more autonomy, as we give them more independence, there are risks that come with that. And those are things that we talk about with our residents when they move in. So they understand, you know, our fall rates are not lower than the national average because we allow people independence. We want them to be functioning as much as they can. And so, you know, we allow them to walk more than other residents. We allow them to walk through courtyards by themselves. We allow them to be in a room behind a closed door where they have their privacy. And so there are, I think, regulations that need to catch up with this movement where we're not penalized for allowing residents to have that dignity where it comes with risks. Um, so those are my recommendations. You know, um, I wanted to show you, so this is our greenhouse. So greenhouses can look different. I think a lot of people picture that house in a small community, we're in urban setting. So like I said, we're on University in Fairview in St. Paul, and we have six greenhouses, and they are stacked one on top of the other. Um, you can see we have private rooms, our dining room, like Dr. Zimmerman's presentation. Our residents come together with our nursing assistants, and they eat together, and they share their days together. So it's a really nice model of care where they come together in this area. And then even being in the middle of St. Paul on University City Avenue, we find ways to bring them green space and that they have spaces where they can go and connect to nature and be outside of their rooms. So that's our model of care. Yeah. Yeah. When you say these are six on top of each other, so all six of your greenhouse homes are in the same building? Is yes. that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. And then um, just one other building question. Um, does... Does the service provider own the building or is the building leased from a, a real estate firm or something? Yes, so we're a nonprofit organization and we do own the building. So Episcopal Homes has been around for 130 years and we do uh, own all of our properties. Okay, does Episcopal Homes have a service side and a real estate side or is it all the same? It's all the same. All right, thank you yeah. very much. I appreciate yes. the answer to that question. Appreciate your being with us today. And next, we will have the Minnesota Care Providers and Leading Age coming together. We are running late. <laughs> so many aspirations for this committee. Lots of testimony to be heard. Um, I don't know which of you will begin, so if you'll just state your name for the record and begin your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the Legislative Task Force on Aging, my name is Angela Guerin. I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy for Care Providers of Minnesota, and I'm here today on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. The Long-Term Care Imperative, we put a survey into the field in late November to learn more about the public's perception of the current state of long-term care. Um, a statewide sample of 800 Minnesotans were surveyed, and some of our key findings you'll see on this slide Folks from across the state and the political spectrum overwhelmingly believe that seniors have the right to basic housing, care, and support. And overall, most Minnesotans believe we're not ready for the aging boom, as we heard from the state demographer. As demand for care rises with our growing aging population, we must keep pace to meet the needs, and the public agrees that the state is underprepared to meet those needs. We also heard from Minnesotans that they expect care to be in their communities within 40 minutes from their home. 
and many respondents would rather move away and um, leave the workforce, would rather leave the workforce than move away from their home communities or send their loved one away for the care that they need and deserve. Respondents were asked questions regarding the quality and safety of services provided in senior, to seniors in long-term care, and overall, the sector received high marks. The majority of Minnesotans with a loved one who uses long-term care services say providers do an excellent job ensuring resident safety and rate overall quality as excellent. We also want to point out how important our caregivers are. Minnesotans agree that caregiving is difficult, valuable work, and these caregivers deserve to be paid more. The long-term care imperative also conducted an internal survey of members to gather data on facility occupancy, job vacancies, and facility closures. One key takeaway is that nursing facility occupancy improved slightly during 2023. It's worth noting that long-term care settings are still recovering from the impact of the pandemic and that setting occupancy is most often dependent on staffing and is still not back to pre-pandemic levels. Across the state, long-term care settings reduced capacity in response to the pandemic and workforce availability. Some regions experiencing this impact more than others. Our survey results indicate that some improvement has begun. However, nursing facilities and assisted living facilities have a long way to go to return to pre-pandemic access and workforce conditions. For example, as you see on this slide, the caregiver vacancy rate for assisted living still sits at 15%, and it's over 20% in nursing facilities. This data tells us that providers are adapting to their new normal. Many facilities are no longer comparing vacancies to pre-pandemic levels. Vacancies in key long-term care positions were at nearly 18,000 statewide in January of this year. In turn, Ask you, sure. um, because of the abbreviation on the slide, just so the public has an idea, uh, so you use CNA and you use ULP, if you would just state what those abbreviations stand for for the public. It's unlicensed personnel. So this, um, in turn, is preventing many providers' in, um, efforts to increase capacity. Long-term care remains in a fragile state. Long-term facilities are still likely to close. Over 19% of assisted living facilities are considering sale, with 6.3% considering closure. While nursing facilities, over 16%, are considering sale, with another 97 considering closing altogether. And when it comes to DHS background studies, they continue to present a costly delay to onboarding new staff in our settings. Over half of our providers indicated that they've experienced processing delays. At a time when we have over 17,000 vacancies, expedient onboarding is a critical factor to getting staff to work. Additionally, effective February 1st, the background study cost was shifted back to the provider. This deviates from historical practice, and funds were previously appropriated to MDH to cover these costs. These are costs that our providers are unwilling to pass on to prospective employees, and they haven't budgeted to cover the cost. However, the long-term care imperative is grateful for the crucial investments made in the sector last session. The legislature invested $300 million in one-time funding to nursing homes in the form of debt consolidation grants, workforce incentives, and temporarily increasing the daily reimbursement rate by leveraging federal Medicaid funds. Those one-time dollars helped struggling providers keep their doors open in a time of crisis. We believe this is reflected in the slight improvement in our occupancy rates, as the data just showed. We also recognize the $412 million that was committed to the Elderly Waiver Program for community-based services for low-income seniors in assisted living. 
We continue to advocate for a successful implementation of PACE in Minnesota, and we were pleased that an actuarial study for PACE passed last session and is due by March of this year, and the study implementation plan is due in September. Another tool became available in our toolboxes thanks to the legislature last session. Um, a new law uh, incentivizing high school juniors and seniors to pursue jobs in long-term care by alert allowing them to earn high school elective credits for doing so was passed, so thank you. We also appreciate the $80 million in HCBS grants that um, our employers were able to access to use for employee bonuses, childcare, transportation, and other one-time compensation. Um, I, would also, I would like to turn it over to my imperative partner, Erin. State your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the task force. My name is Erin Hubert, and I am the Vice President of Advocacy for Leading Age Minnesota, the other half of the long-term care imperative. Um, now that you have had a high-level sense of what Minnesotans are expecting around caring for our older adults, and you got a very brief kind of pulse on the state of the sector, I'm going to spend some time talking about our policy and tactical recommendations with respect to how to serve all of these individuals as we grow older. So first, I'd like to highlight a new joint collaboration between the Imperative and the Health Department. Um, we have launched a campaign called the Caring Careers Start Here campaign, um, and it is made possible by a grant through the CDC and then executed through the Department of Health. So this campaign really will launch more publicly in the next few months um, and is designed to promote caregiving as a career and centered around that relationship-based care. So you're really emphasizing the critical role of caregivers and then doing a personalized matching approach when it comes to your job search. So instead of a static website where you're looking at jobs, this is really an opportunity for our members who are seeking uh, applicants and, and job seekers to really personalize how they're looking for the best fit of employment for them. Um, our greatest hope is that um, you know, this will be sort of the one-stop shop, can't go wrong portal for anyone who is interested in starting a career in this profession. Okay. Um, as you can see, this is a little bit of a preview of some of the shots that we're starting to build into the website. But again, it'll launch in a few months and we're really excited about it. Okay. In addition to the workforce initiatives that we tackle together, like the Caring Careers Can't Start Here campaign, each of our respective organizations have several workforce development strategies aimed at helping senior care providers recruit, retain, and develop talent within their communities. Um, and so alongside those tactical initiatives, which may vary depending on which association you're speaking to, um, we obviously jointly bring some policy solutions to you as members of the legislature or as advocates as part of this task force. So I will talk a little bit about some of those. Um, a top priority, of course, among them is addressing caregiver compensation. While working in this field is a calling of service, um, we know that take-home pay is important. And at the end of the day, people shouldn't be expected to learn, earn less just because it is a job for people with compassion and empathy and respect for our elders. Um, that is why the imperative and its member support providing caregivers with family sustaining livable wages. And as you saw in our public opinion findings, Minnesotans believe that is reasonably around $25 an hour. We have and will continue to seek legislative support for our nursing home workers to earn $25 by 2025. This cannot be done without legislative investment. The current value-based reimbursement system, or VBR, as is often, uh, often referred, does have a system for accelerating wage growth within um, the salaries and compensation of nursing home workers. However, as it has been covered in the past, it reflects historical costs, not current costs. And so what that really ends up meaning is that if left on its own, nursing home workers may not reach that really important $25 an hour threshold until 2028. And that's really too long to wait when nursing homes are losing talent to other industries who can meet or better that wage right now. 
We also support improving the financial policy for both elderly waiver and VBR. So very briefly, because I think this gets uh, into very detailed finance questions. Um, the VBR system today um, does not take into account that 21 month delay that happens between when a nursing home submits its cost report and then when they get their reimbursement rate from DHS. And so you're asking a nursing home to essentially carry the costs of expenses during that entire time. And as anyone who has to manage a home budget or a business budget or any type of budget knows, um, it gets very, very tight when inflation gets high as it did over the last few years. Um, at the end of the day, when, that, when those budgets get really, really tight, what ultimately ends up happening is that access to care becomes jeopardized. So we do support creating a known cost factor, which would help us reduce that uh, financial burden of those carrying costs. On the elderly waiver side, uh, we again are very grateful for the funding and the methodology change that was passed in 2023. It does, we will just call out, lock um, the benchmark data to 2017 wages. We're already in 2024, so the longer you move away from 2017, the less accurate that representation of cost is, and therefore the less valuable the elderly waiver framework is of representing the true cost of care. Um, and as we look to a policy year, I'm very excited to talk about some of our policy solutions for this year. Um, in Minnesota, to work in a nursing home as a certified nurse aide or a CNA, um, a person has to complete both a, a training program and then a test. And that test comprises of a written exam and then an in-person skills exam. And at the moment, that written exam is only available in English. Um, as we welcome an increasingly diverse workforce, it is very important to us and to our members um, that we have some language accommodation for the written portion of the test. So we do support and we'll be bringing forward legislation to require MDH to offer that language accommodation. Um, in that survey that we had of our members, we found that about 20% of applicants uh, failed the written exam due to that language barrier. We are also looking to expand opportunities to a program called Trained Medication Aid. It's a, an opportunity for someone who is, for example, a CNA, wants to receive some additional training and then help support medication uh, services within a nursing home, as an example. Um, and at the moment, uh, you can only access those training programs through higher education institutions and programs. And for a variety of reasons, they may not be offered in every academic setting, every semester, at the right time of day, we all lead very complicated lives with complex schedules. And so we are looking to expand access to those training programs to other education programs that the Department of Health can approve um, and look forward to bringing that forward as well. This will be modeled after the program that already exists for our CNAs or certified nurse aides. Um, we discovered uh, that uh, there's an existing summer healthcare internship program that runs grants through the Department of Health um, that program is available to a lot of licensed healthcare providers. Um, and oddly, it excludes assisted living settings. And so we would encourage the legislature to expand those summer healthcare internship programs to include assisted living providers. Um, and as a, a matter of workforce development and pipeline promotion, uh, would also encourage those grants to cover the full cost of scholarship for long-term care providers in general. I have just a couple left and then I'll wrap up, Madam Chair. Um, healthcare settings have had a pretty complicated relationship with temporary staff. Our members would obviously much prefer to hire caregivers as full-time equivalents. However, during workforce shortages, the pandemic, et cetera, um, sometimes you do have to use temporary staff to support the care in seniors in your building. Um, that said, our state's SNSA, or Supplemental Nurse Staffing Agency, statutes are pretty old, um, and they don't really reflect the marketplace of temporary staffing arrangements today. Uh, so we support some efforts to ensure better quality, safety, training, and oversight of these organizations. Um, I believe this Minnesota Department of Health has been looking at this as well. Um, and further, we would support legislation that would allow an employer to recover penalties if they are assessed. Uh, due to negligent assignment of an SNSA staff. So if you are an SNSA and you send a staff person to uh, an employer to a facility, that individual does something that is egregious enough in nature that it causes the facility to receive a survey deficiency, 
we believe it's fair for that employer to actually recover that final, that that penalty from uh, the SNSA. Um, we found in a survey that uh, about 6.6% of assisted living settings and 14.5% of nursing homes reported a survey deficiency as a result of insufficiently trained or incompetent temporary staff. Um, I think this has been discussed briefly, but I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't cover it here. In terms of workforce development, we do support legislation that would allow licensed practical nurses or LPNs to work in assisted living settings to the top of their current scope of practice. Not only is this position grounded in necessity due to the pervasive statewide shortage of RNs, but the specific issue at hand is the use of something called the focused assessment, which again is in their current scope of practice and they can therefore already do in other settings like in acute care settings. Um, so we think it is reasonable and equitable to allow these LPNs to do the work that they could do in other credentialed settings. Um, and as, in, as my colleague mentioned, we do support reinstating the MDH background studies uh, supported cost for uh, MDH licensed providers to help us address that unbudgeted expense. Um, Madam Chair, for the sake of time, I think the last thing I'll say, um, we would like to have a conversation uh, at the legislature and with stakeholders around um, some regulatory simplification and administrative relief for our assisted living providers. Um, we unequivocally support and stand by quality improvement, transparency and oversight, strong consumer protections, and preservation of autonomy and choice for seniors. However, um, we haven't really revisited these statutes in a meaningful way since they were codified in 2019. Um, and the current framework is having an impact on affordability. Um, it is having an impact on employee burnout and retention. And critically, and uh, unfortunately, it is beginning to have an impact on the safety of residents and staff. Um, so the absence of adjusting some of these issues is further exacerbating uh, the problem and undermining the very goals that everyone sought to achieve in that landmark 2019 legislation. So. Thank you. I just kind of ask if you are able to just kind of hang around if we have time at the end and we have other questions. Um, then I would want you to be available to answer those if you don't sure. mind. All right, thank, thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate hearing from you. Next, we will have uh, SEIU Health. Welcome, Mr. Vaccaro. If you will please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Um, Madam Chair, members of the task force, my name is Rick Varco. I am the political director of SEIU Healthcare Minnesota and Iowa. Um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about who we are um, and then focus on two of our most long-term care associated groups, our home care workers and our nursing home workers, and then I will uh, have a couple of recommendations. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go pretty fast because I know you have a lot more uh, to get to. So. Um, we are 50,000 healthcare workers. We represent uh, the full spectrum of healthcare. So seniors uh, going to the hospital for a knee replacement, seniors going to a clinic for routine blood pressure monitoring, uh, and then seniors who need nursing home care or seniors who need some home care to stay in their home all work with SEIU members. Um, we are growing rapidly. I won't go through the numbers, but I think this rapid growth is in part a reflection of a workforce that's in crisis. Uh, workers want to have more say on the job because they are worried about um, uh, conditions. Um, our largest group is our home care group. Uh, we have 20,000 uh, self-directed home care workers covered by a contract. It's uh, public sector, open shop. Uh, the most important thing for this group is that it is Contracts are funded and ratified by the legislature, and about 31% of our clients are seniors. Um, and uh, the most important thing for this committee is that they keep seniors out of much more expensive institutional care. Uh, so dollars invested in home care can help the state save money. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's way in the weeds uh, and talk a little bit about our home care contract. Um, 
We are very excited about our home care contract. Uh, we have, uh, we've gone from a 1075 minimum wage in 2015 to $19 an hour now. Um, and it's gonna be $20 an hour at the start of the next year. Um, we have some benefits that I'm not gonna really talk about and I'll skip to um, sort of a summary of where the industry is at. Um, I talked to one of our organizers. He says, we're hopeful. It feels like we pulled out of a nosedive. Um, the workforce had, you know, it had been almost impossible to find new caregivers. It was held together by family caregivers. Um, this new $19 minimum wage, we really think is gonna make a difference with recruitment. Uh, but, you know, he said, people have only gotten one or two checks. So it is hard to point to concrete uh, improvements uh, right away. Um, Moving on, uh, nursing homes. Uh, we represent um, about uh, 4,000 nursing home workers. These are private sector uh, uh, workers under the federal uh, uh, National Labor Relations Act. My union represents about 30 nursing homes. There are other unions in Minnesota, predominantly AFSCME, the steel workers, uh, the food and commercial workers. Overall, about 30% of the industry is organized. Um, I think it's something like about 90 out of 330 homes or so. Um, and uh, we're very excited about the new Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board that the legislature created, which has the power to set minimum uh, labor standards. Um, I think it would be good for me to move on to recommendations. Um, two big ones and uh, uh, then a smorgasbord. Um, big one for home care is uh, we think this new higher minimum wage has really going to address the recruitment, but we have a huge retention problem. Uh, over 50% of the workforce turns over in a given year. We think enhancing the benefits under the contract, especially retirement, uh, will help retain workers. This is especially important for seniors. Uh, we have a lot of people who come into the workforce to take care of a family member, but if we could keep them in this workforce doing the work, we think that would help seniors find people to help care for them. Um, and I'll just mention that you, the legislature also created the Secure Choices Retirements Accounts. That's something it's kind of a, a low cost IRA run through the state retirement account. That might be a good uh, uh, um, option for this population. So we encourage you to encourage the executive branch to negotiate with us. Uh, we'll go into negotiations at the end of the year. Hopefully we will get something with some retirement provisions and uh, we would be coming to you uh, next session to get that funded and ratified. Uh, nursing homes. Um, I. Uh, uh, the summary of the where we were at that I, I, I skipped over was um, we have plateaued at an unsustainable level. Um, uh, I agree with a lot of what the industry said. I'll just say the biggest crisis we see is unsustainable levels of overtime. People are working doubles day after day after day. Um, and it's really a sort of uh, pro uh, an interrelated problem of you can't get your more staff unless you get your census up to fix your reimbursement, but you can't get your census up if you can't hire more staff. Um, we think the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board, which brings together uh, uh, worker representatives, industry representatives, and uh, representatives from the executive branch can maybe come up with a proposal. Uh, that proposal may very well need to be funded by the legislature. If that happens, um, we will be coming to you hopefully with a uh, proposal that might uh, help pull this industry uh, to where I think we all want it to be. And then uh, just some final uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, I'd like to note that our home care programs are one of the few programs in long-term care that doesn't have sort of a built-in inflationary increase. Um, we think that would be a good addition. Uh, unlike VBR or DWRS, uh, the, the funding uh, doesn't have a, a built-in uh, uh, increase. Um, other things, uh, we'd like to promote self-direction, maybe try to make it more of a default option within home care. Um, self-direction is the official policy of uh, the state in statute, but sort of cashing that out in actual terms uh, could probably use some more work. 
Um, we'd like to look at something around uh, maybe a pilot project around nursing home pensions. We see a real problem with people moving from home to home to home, uh, a lot of turnover. Uh, uh, we think pensions are a good way to keep people invested in that job and in that facility for the long term. And then finally, I, I would echo what my colleagues in the industry said about immigration. Anybody who's spent time uh, in the long-term care sector knows that this workforce really relies on immigrant labor. We are very fortunate that there are people all over this world who would like to come to America and help take care of our people. Um, and anything we can do to help that. I know last session the legislature passed some wraparound services for long-term care workers. We're working with the department on that. Continued support like that would be uh, very helpful. Um, people want to work. They want to serve our seniors, but uh, there are challenges and barriers to participating in the workforce that they could use some help with. Um, thank you. I hope that was brief enough. Speed and the efficiency. Thank you very much. And you've given us a lot to um, think about and to work towards. So thank you very much for your testimony. I greatly appreciate it. Um, next, we will move on to Elder Voices Advocates. Um, Ms. Sundberg and Ms. Kelso, if you'll come to the testifier's table. When you're ready, if you'll state your name for um, the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the task force. I'm Chris Sundberg, and I'm executive director of Elder Voice Advocates. And with me is Kathy Kelso, board member of uh, Elder Voice. Uh, today, we'll, we'll discuss both our thoughts on long-term care and offer our recommendation to establish a Minnesota Department for Community Aging. Elder Voice Advocates was organized in 2017 by family members whose loved ones were grievously abused and neglected in long-term care facilities throughout the state. We have broadened our advocacy to also include people living with disability who suffer with subpar care and other inequities. I'm skipping through things here, okay. Uh, We've had several uh, accomplishments over the years. In 2019, uh, uh, Elder Voice with other advocacy groups got the, uh, 20, the assisted living licensure uh, law passed. Uh, in 2022, we launched Elder Care IQ, which is a screening tool to help people quickly uh, get uh, quality care information. And uh, in 2023, we, that uh, screening tool was honored by the Finnegan Freedom of Information Award. And of course, as you know, we were very supportive of the legislative task force on aging and were uh, hopeful for uh, your support uh, of our recommendations. Uh, over several decades, federal and multiple state governments have invested millions of dollars through research and grants in pursuit of evidence-based practices to improve quality of care and life for long-term care recipients. Unfortunately, few of these recommendations and innovations have been implemented, resulting in a long-term care system that is struggling to provide safe, quality care. Bottom line, the most important component of quality care is the way in which the care is delivered and by whom. We must have many more well-educated caregivers who are paid a living wage with benefits. Equally important is the need for measurable systems with accountability. This uh, is a recent example uh, in January uh, 22nd of this year, the Star Tribune published an article in the opinion exchange section from uh, Teresa Mondembe, a certified nursing assistant in which she sounds an alarm and quote, Minnesota has run out of time. The staffing crisis is in our nursing homes is putting residents at risk and we desperately need to draw more dedicated nursing home workers into the field. The current wages and working conditions won't do it. 
I would add that the same situation also exists in assisted living. She further states that it is her hope that the newly established Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board will set minimum nursing home employment standards to protect the health and welfare for workers. This board, however, is within the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, further furthering the fragmentation of aging and care services. A step forward uh, on the national level is the September 1st, 2023 Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services proposals uh, to issue minimum staffing standards for long-term care facilities and the Medicaid Institutional Pre Payment Transparency Reporting Requirement. The rule would establish comprehensive nurse and CNA staffing uh, requirements. A major concern, however, is the lack of statewide plans that fully address the needs of those receiving long-term care. While an attempt to establish staffing requirements is welcome, this proposed rule continues to perpetuate fragmented attention to our aging demographic rather than endorse statewide plans that establish a long-term care delivery system that includes improvements in education, care standards, and accountability, all necessary to improve quality of care. It's it's not advancing, sorry. It's not advancing. Uh, so uh, it, it's imperative that we be forward thinking by focusing on a statewide plan. No, that's not it. Mm -hmm. There we go, thank you. Uh, that we plan, uh, focus on a statewide plan that considers the full spectrum of aging in the community of our choice. With well-planned and improved infrastructure and support systems, most of us can live in our communities as we age, not long-term care institutional settings. Okay. Kathy. Is this on? Okay. So going forward, we consider... Oh, thank you. I'm Kathy Kelso, a member of the board for Elder Voice Advocates. Going forward, Elder Voice Advocates proposals that the, proposes that the Legislative Task Force on Aging recommends the establishment of a Minnesota Department for Community Aging, a legislative proposal to be introduced and enacted in 2025. We believe that we must plan for necessary resources for aging Minnesotans to thrive in our communities and incorporate accessible services within our communities as a component of the health care system, not segregated as we are now. We require a state department for community aging within the executive branch that shares equal prominence with all state agencies a department that will house and optimize existing age-related programs and services now fragmented and located across agencies. Our proposal is strengthened by this fact. In the recently published set of strategic plans for all state departments entitled One Minnesota Plan 2024 to 2027, None of the state departments mention the immediate impact of aging and disabilities on Minnesota. The Department of Human Services mentions aging and disability, disability only by acknowledging that these are target populations for the department. No state agency is responsible for a public discussion about aging. No agency is, is responsible for a statewide plan on aging and its implementation. A Department for Community Aging is critically necessary to ensure that our state develops and sustains a long-term workforce statewide. A department is critically necessary to bring innovations to scale and deliver them statewide. Our Department for De Community Aging must lead the way in analyzing all the data 
that counties, area agencies on aging, and others have collected for decades and continue to collect on gaps in services statewide. This analysis is imperative for planning and successful elimination of fragmented, confusing, and underfunded community-based long-term care and long-term care. Minnesotans rely on systems within our communities to age well, sufficient safe housing that is affordable for seniors, safe transportation within communities, parks and recreation, food availability, community businesses that recognize opportunities when engaging with an aging population, libraries as evolving community centers. A Department for Community Aging would be charged to work across these systems and within communities to develop and sustain economic resources, making it possible for community elders to remain functional, active, and know the feeling of belonging where they live. Our proposal for a Department for Community Aging requires a public examination about the urgency of aging in Minnesota. It is imperative that we formally recognize and establish a state agency that will lead us in future opportunities and innovations across the state. We must recognize that we are aging and living longer. We know that the percentage of elders in rural counties is rapidly increasing without plans to address inadequate and limited resources. We require an agency to ensure that we develop and sustain a long-term care workforce statewide with livable income, benefits, education, and career advancement opportunities. We require statewide analysis of the financial impact of aging for individuals, for families and whole communities when people are displaced due to the lack of services, housing that is safe and affordable, transportation, and additional community resources. We require a newly designed housing and real rehabilitation of older homes because today our combined efforts to assist elders to age well at home is inadequate and will become largely unavailable <coughs> in part due to the lack of housing that is affordable. We have heard numerous presentations before the task force on aging about issues and concerns that demand our full attention and a statewide plan. And I might say today we heard quite a bit of testimony that would underscore the necessity for a centralized department planning for the future of aging and building infrastructure in Minnesota. Elder Voice Advocates proposes a Department for Community Aging that will address all these facts before us, a department that will take the lead in a multi-sector generated statewide plan of action with directions to meet economic, social, and health challenges ahead. The Minnesota Department of Community Aging will prove our state is committed to ensure healthy communities and care as we age. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And you know, we saw in the last forecast the increase of cost to the state. It is a number that we can't ignore going forward. And I appreciate your recommendations um, you. for how we would go forward and navigate that process. Um, members, I had hoped that we would have time for a robust conversation. Um, I have several questions that I would like to ask of the committee for future discussion. And I think what we'll do is we will email these questions to the members of the task force um, so that the task force would have time to think about them and prepare responses um, for these questions for us to discuss in public beginning in the March meeting. But I would also um, ask Mr. George to post these questions that go to the membership, to the community as well. So it'll be posted on the dashboard for you to see them um, setting the stage for our March meeting. And I would invite your responses as well uh, to these questions so that we would have an opportunity to have a more robust conversation uh, with your comments in mind. So the, look for those um, going forward. 
as we enter session on Monday, it seems impossible that we're in session. It doesn't seem like the last one has quit yet. Um, but um, we will be we will have our meetings on Friday mornings as this meeting is on a Friday morning. Um, do we know which room we'll be in yet? For our March meeting, thank you. Chairman. For our March meeting, we'll be in G23. For our April meeting, we'll be in Capital 120. Uh, we'll finalize the May meeting later on, but we'll get back to you on that. So I will ask everybody, just heads up, check the website to make sure that you know where you're going. Uh, when session is in place, of course, the legislative activity will always take uh, the priority over the room space. So um, because this room has both remote and um, personal testifying possible, it would be our room of preference. But please check the website to be sure that you know where the meeting will be held. And with that, I think we're just going to adjourn early <laughs> and then um, be prepared for that robust conversation in the March meeting. And with that, members, we are adjourned. Recording stopped.